We've been having some glitches with the sound system this morning for some reason. I don't know if it's gremlins or just little demons or what. So if you have a struggle at any time hearing me, please raise your hand. And Jason will see you and he'll make some adjustments. No, you have to pay attention first, Ben, all right? Did everybody notice you didn't hear a single yee-haw this morning? Thank you, Ben. <laughs> We're teaching Ben new words. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, would you find the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and then find chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Shania, you don't get to hang out back there just because you sing on the worship team. Come on out and have a seat. I have the worship team, as soon as they get done, they go get in line for the bathroom, you know. So, I don't know what it is about singing up here, you know, drinking all that water. I know somebody's in there. I'm just trying to embarrass you, Dorothea. I mean, how many people get a congregation to look at them standing in line for the bathroom? Acts chapter 6. We've been going through Acts, and we've been talking about how Jesus builds the church, or how he intended to build his church. Remember, Jesus came to this earth for two reasons. One, to save the lost. How many of you used to be lost? How many of you are now found, saved in Jesus Christ? How many of you are part of his church? So he came to save the lost and to build his church. Acts chapter 6, starting with verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Permanus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, Acts chapter 6 tells us that after the church met the needs of its widows, it says the number of disciples increased rapidly. Well, what caused this dramatic explosion of growth, and, and what is there in there that we can learn from? Well, we're going to talk about that, but first I want you to find a few people to give a hug, a handshake, or a high five, and tell them that this morning we're going to talk about Jesus' key to church growth. Jesus' key to church growth. Go ahead. <laughs> 
All right. If you're done handshaking, hugging, and high-fiving, if you would start making your way back to your pew, your seat. And while you're doing that, would you let me pray? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity of this morning. Father, thank you for the coolness that we felt when we walked outside our doors. Not that we're looking forward to winter, but Father, sometimes it's a relief from the humidity and the heat that we've experienced. But also, Lord, it just makes us feel alive to experience the elements of your creation. Thank you for the weather. And yet, the weather can cause some terrible havoc in some places. So we, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, especially along the uh, eastern coast and down south in Texas that uh, are experiencing some devastation from the weather. And Father, we pray that you would use our brothers and sisters to minister to everybody around them. Here this morning, Father, we pray that you would begin to help us to release anything that would prevent us from paying attention to you, from focusing on your word and allowing your Holy Spirit to reveal what you want us to to understand. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to know, uh, when I told you to share that this morning we're going to be talking about Jesus' key to church growth, that Peggy immediately came up and showed me her key that says, this is Jesus' key. That's her church key. It's Jesus' key to the church. But Jesus has a key to church growth. A lot of times... I've experienced and some of you have experienced going to a conference or a workshop or some kind of gathering or event uh, about church growth and there's strategies and there's different things for church growth. It's not all that difficult. Jesus teaches us how to build his church and Jesus has a key for church growth. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Not the latest strategy. Not any of the marketing research that goes on, but simply Jesus and his word, his key for church growth. Now, back in the 17th century, there was a German preacher named August Frank. He'd seen the homeless children in his city, and and he was so moved by their living conditions that he decided to found an orphanage for them. But as is often the case with with such ministries like that, money was tight. It was always tight, and he hardly had enough funds to feed the children. And so what little funds he did have, he was very frugal with. Well, one day a widow came to his door begging for just a single gold coin, a duka. She sadly uh, was telling him how in need she was, And, and, and he sadly explained that He just didn't have any money to spare and had no way to help her. And and to his shock, she just collapsed right there on her step and, and she began sobbing and weeping and moved by her tears. August Frank asked her to wait while he went into his room and prayed. And the more he prayed, the more compelled he felt that God was prompting him to give this widow the money he did have. And so he did. Two days later, he received a warm letter from this widow giving thanks, saying that because of his generosity, she, she'd asked the Lord to shower the orphanage with gifts. He was touched by the letter, but he was even more surprised when later that day, a, a rich woman from the city came to his door and she, she gave him 12 gold coins, 12 ducats. Not long after that, a friend from Sweden came and and gave him two more, and he was humbled to think that God had so amply rewarded him and the orphanage for his meager gift to this one single widow. But God wasn't done yet, because it seems that there was a German prince that had died not long before this, and in his will, he had left more than 500 pieces of gold as a bequest and inheritance to the orphanage. So a preacher met the needs of a destitute widow, and God rewarded him. In our text this morning, we read a similar story. Now, I know most of you look at Acts chapter 6 and these first seven verses, and you're thinking about deacons. Yeah, the first deacons. That's not what I want to look at. 
Because there's more to the message than that. There's more to that scripture than that. In that text, we read a similar story, just like this preacher, August Frank. By the time we get to this story in Acts chapter 6, remember that the early church had experienced some very exciting times. Remember at Pentecost, 3,000 Jews repented of their sins and were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And then, over the next few days, the church grew even more to 5,000 and then more. But then they hit this snag. You may recall from previous chapters that there were a number of people in this fledgling church that were needy. Remember, they'd they'd come from a, a great distance. Many of them had traveled from a great distance. And when they were converted to Jesus, when they became, you know, saved through Jesus, when they when they came into a relationship with Jesus and became a new creation, they decided to stay right there in Jerusalem with all the other believers. And so people like Barnabas went and and sold their property and they gave the proceeds to the apostles to, to give out, to distribute to the poor. But there was a problem. The problem was that the church of that day suffered from the same kinds of problems that modern congregations of our day have. Have you ever noticed how people at church tend to hang out with folks that they have common interests with. These groups are called cliques. And while cliques have a bad reputation, they're not necessarily all that bad in and of themselves. I mean, everybody has their clique. I mean, people that they're comfortable with. You know, people that that they're comfortable with circling the wagons, if you will. Only hanging out with They're kind of people. People in such cliques end up only spending time with and thinking about their particular circle of friends. So that's that's kind of what happened at Jerusalem. There were the local Christians, the Jewish believers that had been born and raised right there around Jerusalem. Then there were the outsiders. They were called the the Hellenists or the Grecians, if you will. They were Jewish believers also, but their accent was different. And and because they'd been born and raised in other countries, they didn't quite fit in with the locals. Well, it seems that the local boys who were responsible for taking care of all of the widows were overlooking the widows from out of town. Now, they may not have meant to slight these ladies. It may simply have been just an oversight. But frankly, the Hellenists, the Grecians, just didn't run in their circle. I mean, it was, it was kind of an out of sight, out of mind kind of a thing. I mean, it, I don't know. Whatever the reason, these widows were being ignored. These Hellenist Grecian widows were being ignored in the daily distribution of food, assistance. And some of them were getting upset. The King James translation says that there was some murmuring going on. Murmuring, mur- complaining. We all know murmuring is not a good thing in a church. So this comes to the attention of the apostles. And they say in Acts chapter 6, verses 2, 3, and 4, they say this. It wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. One of my commentaries that I looked at notes that the names of the seven men were all Greek. I mean, it's likely that they were all of this Grecian class, this Hellenistic class, which would effectually restore mutual confidence, you know, through them working and and, and ministering. But now what's really interesting to me is that it says after, after these seven men were selected and after the needs of the widows were met, verse 7 says that, that, that the word of God spread 
the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Do you know what that means? That means that, that, that when the church took care of the widows, the church grew. When the church took care of people in need, the church grew. Now, I'm convinced that if you were to go out to just about any church growth seminar or workshop or conference or whatever, you would never, never, ever, ever hear that a great way for a church to experience dynamic growth would be for them to take care of widows and orphans and the needy. It just wouldn't be the cutting edge kind of teaching. And I would be willing to bet that you never hear this proposed in any of those kind of seminars. And yet that's precisely what we just read here in Acts chapter 6. When they met the needs of the widows, the disciples multiplied greatly. They increased rapidly. Now what you'll often hear from many church growth experts is that a church needs to know who they're going after. A successful church, we're told, needs to have a target audience. I mean, a church needs to decide who they're going to target so they can focus all of their, their energy, all of their advertising, all of their methods, all of their activities on that target group. So, you know, are they going to go after the millennials? Are they going to go after the young families? Are they going to go after the upwardly mobile business folks? Whatever target that they choose, you know, once they know who to target, they know how to market themselves to that specific group. I have to admit that that method that probably works. I suspect such a technique could yield a prominent, powerful, dynamic congregation. But that kind of thinking has always annoyed me. You want to know why it annoys me? Because Jesus had only one group of people that he went after. He had only one target audience that he focused on. They were called sinners. Sinners. Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the millennials. No, he didn't say that. He said the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In Luke chapter 5, verse 32, he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus never went after rich and, 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 and the powerful. He didn't tailor his ministry to young married couples. He didn't fashion his message for the millennials of his age. Do you know what Jesus did do? He spent his time with the common people. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He raised a widow's son from the dead. He said to his audiences, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He spent his time with what the world would consider rejects. He spent his time with sinners and tax collectors, the people that the world considered losers. Jesus built his church on the outcasts of society. Even his 12 disciples weren't all that impressive. And now here in, Luke, or in Acts chapter 6, God is, is driving that truth home to us again. The only way to build the kind of church Jesus wants to build is to reach out to the poor, the needy, the rejected of society. That's the way to build Christ's church. That's the way Jesus builds his church. But you may wonder why. Why would helping the widows and the orphans and needy, why would that cause a church to grow the way that Jesus wants it to grow? I can think of two reasons. One, if we do this, I mean this, this help the poor and the widows and the orphans thing, if we do this, God will build his church because it's a supernatural thing. See, it doesn't make any sense. That's why we have all these growth seminars, these church growth seminars, because that's man's reasoning. That's the things, the strategies that people come up with. But our God is a supernatural God. He doesn't need a, 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 a strategy. He doesn't need the research. He doesn't need a target group. God is supernatural, and our God makes these kinds of people a priority. Psalm 68 verse 5 tells us that God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. And in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17, God tells his people to learn to do right, 
to seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. And in the New Testament, God repeats that same message for us. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It's like a drumbeat throughout Scripture. God loves it when his people help the poor, when his people help the afflicted, when his people help those in need, especially when we do it for those who struggle in church. That's what Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 tells us. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, I believe that that's what's happened around here. That's what's happened here at the church on the boulevard. I mean, there's our food pantry, our free community dinners, our recovery programs, our ministry to moms with kids in heavens and, and to others who, who suffered terrible losses. And we're not a rich church. I mean, think about it. It took us a while to save up for this carpet that we put down in here. We did most of the work ourselves. And we're working on making other changes. Changes to accommodate people, you know, accommodate people with disabilities. I mean, we're starting a new, here's a term for you, a new building campaign, a building fund campaign. An extra offering, right? Because we're, we're doing missionary offerings for the state convention right now. We're collecting up some money for our, 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 our foreign missionary that we support, uh, Beth. Uh, and, and after we, we get done with that, we're, we're going to ask to start taking up some more offering so that we can finish, uh, we can construct this handicap ramp out front and, and maybe make this, this lot beside the church usable for children and parking. So... You know, we're not a rich church, but I guess what it boils down to is that we give sacrificially and God uses that. And we live in hard times, but this church doesn't neglect anybody in need. I mean, we spend a lot of money, I mean, money that... That we, that we collect to assist those in need, you know, with, with, whether the need is food or gas or, or help with bills or, you know, sometimes rent or, or even if somebody needs to stay in a motel to get off the streets or something like that. And I am so proud of this church that my chest swells up and sometimes I just feel like I could bust out in song. Don't worry, I'm not going to bust out in song. But I believe God has blessed us for being generous, even though it requires sacrifice. I believe that God is especially appreciative when we do what we do sacrificially. It's like in Mark chapter 12, you know, where we're told about the time when Jesus was at the temple and, and, and he was watching his people uh, put their money into the offering box. And, and, I, and I don't know specifically about the offering box, but some scholars believe that this, this offering box that, that was there that Jesus was watching people put their money in, you know, was, 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 was metal and, and it, was, it was almost like a horn or it gave off like a trumpet sound or something, you know, because when the coins would go in, it would make noise as the coins banged down, you know into the box, you know, so that, so that the more coins you put in it, the more noise it would make, and the more people would know how much you was putting in it. Well, Jesus watched as the rich put large sums of money into that box, you know, lots of coins making lots of noise. But then along came this poor widow, and do you know what she put in that box? Two small coins, a widow's might. It was all she had. It was everything she had. In, in Mark chapter 12, verse 43 and 44, we read this. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, 
This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth. They gave out of the extra that they had. But she, she gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all she had to live on. Now, I want you to catch that. Because Jesus paid attention to her gift. Jesus was impressed by her gift. She gave sacrificially to help the poor. And in Acts chapter 6, God is telling us that he paid attention to the church because it took care of its widows. And when they did that, God made the church grow. Now, in my mind, that would be enough, you know, for God to make the church grow. You know, taking care of these people in need. But there's, there's the second reason that the church grew at this point. Because folks around them, folks that were watching what they were doing, hearing what they were doing, began to pay attention. And that's what Jesus said would happen, right? I mean, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I want you to bear in mind, the early church wasn't helping the widows, you know, so that they could be praised, you know, oh, look at that great church over there. You know, they didn't advertise on some kind of marquee how much they'd given to the widows that week. They didn't put out any circular or flyers or anything bragging about their ministry. What they did, they did for Jesus. They were doing what they were doing because that's what Christians we're supposed to do. And people outside the church paid attention. Several years ago, a historian named Rodney Stark wrote a book entitled The Triumph of Christianity. How the Jesus movement became the world's largest religion. As you might imagine, he was describing what led to the phenomenal growth of, of Christ's church in, in the first few centuries. One of the things that he discussed was how the church grew very dynamically in a pagan world, which was the Roman world at that time. He explained that in ancient Rome, the, the pagans had two philosophies that they were diametrically different than Christianity. Two philosophies that were the opposite of Christianity. One was that the Romans feared death. They believed the grave either led to a, a non-existence, led to nothing, or at best a, a drab existence in a shadowy underworld. And so they literally ran from death and clung to life for all they were worth. And the other philosophy was that the Romans viewed mercy and pity as something to be scoffed and ridiculed at. The philosophers, the, the Roman philosophers of, of, of the day taught that, that mercy was unreasonable and that the cry of the undeserving for mercy must go unanswered. Well, it seems that in A.D. 165, a plague struck the Roman Empire that shook the world. When the plague hit a city, Many people, including the doctors, left town. One person of that day noted that the non-Christians, those who were not Christians, deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends. And they, they, they even cast them out into the streets where, where, where they were half dead. And, and, and they left those who were dead like garbage, like refuse, just laying around in heaps unburied. But many of the Christians... Those who were following Christ didn't do that. I mean, they stayed and they, they took care of the sick and the dying. Now, why would they do that? Well, because first, unlike the Romans, Christians didn't fear death. As one author put it, Christians believed that by the merciful grace of God in Christ, they would be raised from the dead to a glorious new life when this perishable body put on the imperishable and this mortal body put on immortality and so death had lost its sting. So Christians believed that if they died from disease contracted while caring for the ill, 
the result for them would be glorious. And so they were able to overcome their fears. The second reason that they stayed and took care of the sick and dying was that unlike the Romans, who felt mercy was a character flaw, the Christians saw mercy was what Jesus had called them to do. Now, I confess, I did not read Rodney Stark's book. What I did do was read an article based on his book. The article was entitled, The Plague and Christian Advantage. Let me share some of this article with you. In AD 165, a plague struck the Roman Empire. In 15 years, from one-fourth to one-third of the entire population died, many needlessly. Another plague with similar results struck a century later. In both plagues, the mortality rate among Christians was much lower than among non-Christians. Why? Hmm. Neither Christians nor pagans had access to any effective medicinal drugs, but the Christians had two things the pagan lacked. As historian Rodney Stark writes in his book, The Triumph of Christianity, most pagans feared death because they expected mere oblivion or at best a drab existence in a shadowy underworld. More importantly, in the pagan world, and especially among the philosophers, mercy was regarded as a character defect and pity as a pathological emotion. Because mercy involves providing unearned help or relief, and that is contrary to justice. One theologian by the name of E.A. Judge explained, he said, classical philosophers taught that mercy indeed is not governed by reason at all. And humans must learn to curb the impulse. The cry of the undeserving for mercy must go unanswered. Judge continued by saying, pity was a a defective character. It was considered a defective character, unworthy of the wise and, and excusable only in those who have not yet grown up. Consequently, when the plagues struck, those who could, like the great physician Galen, fled to avoid the contagion. Those who couldn't flee still tried to avoid the stick. When when their first symptom appeared, victims were, were often thrown into the streets where the dead and, and dying just lay literally in piles. It was different among Christians for two reasons. First, unlike pagans, Christians believed that by the merciful grace of God in Christ, they would be raised from the dead to a glorious new life. So Christians believed that if they died from disease contracted while caring for the ill, the result for them would be glorious, they were able to overcome those fears. Second, Christians had learned mercy from Jesus. Jesus had taught them that in the last judgment, he would say to, to some people, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And they would respond, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And he would answer, truly I say to you, as you did it, to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Not only had Jesus taught mercy toward the sick, he had also exemplified it. He healed the sick. He touched the leopards. He ultimately laid down his life as a substitute for sinners. And though the ancient world lacked antibiotics and other effective medicines, what many sick people simply needed was just water and food. Pagans who feared death and considered pity a character defect usually provided neither. Instead, as Dionysus, the bishop of Alexandria, wrote at the time of that plague, the non-Christians deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends. They cast them out into the streets, half dead and dying. But Christians who didn't fear death considered mercy even at great personal sacrifice, 
They considered mercy a high virtue. Freely and lovingly, they gave basic care to the sick. Indeed, that was the top responsibility of the church deacons. Stark describes the consequences. He said it is entirely plausible that Christian nursing would have reduced mortality by as much as two-thirds. The fact that most stricken Christians survived didn't go unnoticed either. I mean, this, this surely must have produced some conversions, especially by those who were nursed back to health. What went on during the epidemics was only a magnification of what went on every day among the Christians. Because theirs were communities of mercy. Theirs were communities of, 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 of help. Helping others. Helping each other. We need to remember that caring for the sick was much different back then than it is today. I mean, today if you get sick, you can go to the hospital, they give you antibiotics, other medications. But they didn't have any of those things back then. And so if they didn't have any, any of those medicines like we have today back then, how in the world did Christians of that day care for the sick, those who were, 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 were destined to die? They simply gave them what they could. They gave them food, they gave them water, and they gave them compassion. Many of those that they cared for survived. Many of those that they cared for came to know Jesus. Their willingness to help people in the face of certain death influenced a multitude of Romans to turn to Christ. The point here is this. The early church grew the way Jesus wanted them to grow because they had the same priorities as Jesus. Churches that help the poor, help the widows, help the needy will grow. They may not become dynamic mega churches, but that's not the goal. The goal is to become the kind of church Jesus died to establish. When a church does that, then they will grow for God not for themselves, not for anybody else. Christ's kind of church will grow because its people love and serve those in need. Their hands will be hands of servants. Let me close by sharing with you a story that I've shared with you at least once, maybe twice in the past. You may remember it. It took place in the early 1500s. There were two struggling artists who, who decided to share a room and they formed a pact that one of them would work at manual labor to support both of them while the other one worked his art and began to develop clients, you know, patrons. And then as that clientele, those patrons started to come and, and, and profits would come in, then the other artist who had been supporting them could then in turn focus on his artistic works. Well, one of them's name was Albrecht Durer. And he was the first to focus on his art. And his friend spent his time earning whatever he could as a, as a laborer. And Durer eventually became recognized and he began to sell some of his works. But by this time, his friend had used his hands so much in hard labor that they had become gnarled and stiff. And that broke Durer's heart. Then one day as Durer was working on a painting, he heard mumbling in the next room from his friend and thinking something might be wrong, he, he got up and he walked to the door. And there he saw his friend bowing over a, a meal and his hands folded in prayer. And from that scene, Durer painted one of his most remembered paintings ever and gave a memorial to the faithfulness of his friend's servant hands. Most of you may not know or, or remember or uh, who Albert Durer was, but I would imagine that most all of you probably are familiar with this painting. And while you may not have known the artist, you did know of the hands of a servant.
It is the same with the world. The people of this world, the people of our community, the people who we are in relationships with are moved by a church that will show them the hands of a servant. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that reminds us that human strategy and models are not our focus and not our goals. We're to follow your word, Father. We're to know your word and to obey your word. Father, one of the most overlooked keys of church growth comes straight from your word in Acts chapter 6. Simply being servants, taking care of those in need. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us help this church remember that we are servants. We are not above anybody. We are servants. And I pray that we have the hands of a servant. Lord, may our prayer be, take my life and let it be. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.